our wonderful tech guys are giving me the signal. The microphone wasn't switched on. It's on now. All good. No, it's just wonderful to see people just coming in to worship God. And, and uh, I saw Derek. It's fantastic to see Derek again. Derek has been through the mill with lots and lots of surgeries, and um, it's just great to see. Erica, nice to see you visiting with us again. And, and, and Francie, it's, it's brilliant, all these wonderful, wonderful people. Folks, I did, um, Flippy will tell a little bit about those people who need our prayers, a lot of people, a lot of people. So please keep your eyes on the bulletin. To put in the bulletin that our Zoom Bible studies will start this week. They won't. They won't. I looked in my diary and I've got a previous engagement, so they will start next week. Next week. But next Sunday, our adult Bible study, study start right here. I really want to encourage you to stay. Man, if you've, if you've got something better to do than study God's words, by all means, please leave. But I really encourage you to stay um, and, and join, uh, join us for that. I want to speak to you today about how to deal with uncertainty. Because we live in uncertain times. But before we do that, I want to show you some pictures. Because some of us, uh, some of you have been asking, let's just let's go through this. People, listen, now that we move, we're going to baptize people. Well, you know, I'm on, I'm on this WhatsApp group with the Churches of Christ in Africa and the subcontinent. And... Um, Hey, we we got no problem. So this is, uh, this is uh, I think it's Duncan in Zambia, um, sent me this. There we go. Got absolutely no problem whatsoever. We'll just find a stream. We'll find a slurt. Let's have a look at the next one. By the way, if you look at the sign, it says, I, I can't read it all, but Church of Christ, and they spell Sri Lanka somewhere differently. Now, this is a gentleman. I've got a whole bunch of pictures of him. Let's just go back to the previous one. He's a... Uh, they, they, an older man, they lifted him out of a wheelchair. And in a children's blow-up swimming pool, they baptizing the Church of Christ of Langa. Oh, this is just super encouraging to me. Now, let's go to the next one. Um, yeah, this is in India, in Guttalak. Some amazing things happen here. I mean, folks, mind-blowing stuff, almost biblical proportions. Stuff is happening in India with the Churches of Christ there. And uh, this particular day, they baptized 21 people at one time. So not just like one at a time. You'll get in here, and we'll just go around, and we'll just baptize everybody. Uh, and uh, this is a little village in Uganda. And, um, man, they battled to find some water. So they found a culvert there. You know what? The water looks pretty clean to me. So we'll just find, uh, we'll just find a little space between the pipes, and uh, we just baptize, baptize people. Just uh, <laughs> absolutely incredible. Okay, so we can't find clean water. It doesn't matter. We're going to get you baptized anyway. And this is out of uh, Nigeria. Also incredible thing. Nigeria, South Sudan, by the way, the Church of Christ in this, this war-torn country. Uh, you know what? I think what's happened in our country, we've got too much opulence. We don't have enough trouble. God's, the, the kingdom has always grown better when things are bad. When, when what happened in, in AD 70 and we had the diaspora of people just running from Jerusalem for their lives, the church exploded. And that's why we've got, you know, all over the, the, the continent, we've got, uh, all, all over Europe, we've got all those churches. You know, as people went, you've got to know about Jesus, you've got to know about Jesus. They took him with them, even though they were running for their lives. Okay, uh, thanks. Okay, now, uh, you know, I know we're, uh, we're struggling and Rob wants uh, air conditioning in this church and stuff. But I tell you what. We'll have a look at the next church. We, we just built our own church building. And um, this is one of our congregations in Zambia. Folks, look at that floor. Look at the rubble on that floor. And uh, you also might want to look on the right-hand side of your screen. All the people, they've taken their shoes off. Some have got shoes on, but I looked at a lot of people. They just take their shoes off, and they put a top on the rubble, and they're just sitting on that. Don't ever complain about how uncomfortable it is. We, we are like in the most blessed people in the world. And here's one of our congregations building the new church building. They're just so excited. They finally uh, are able to put it up. So thanks, guys. Yeah, we are. Uh, are there any more pictures after that one? Okay, let's go to our, our next slide. And uh, there we go. There's another one. Do you need a building to have a prayer meeting? By the way, if you can't see that, um, these are mealies, by the way. These are the husks of mealies. You know, so they've picked their own food and they've taken all the husks and obviously they made their bread with it. But there's somebody who needs prayers. 
And um, it's just, just awesome, awesome, awesome. Father, forgive us when we complain about how things are, when things are not comfortable enough for us, when we have to walk 20 meters to, from where we've parked. Yes, uh, in Indi- uh, sorry, I, I can't remember whether this was India or Sri Lanka, but um, taking the Lord's Supper together, these house churches just absolutely exploding. Any others? Okay. Let's go back and let's talk today about how to deal with uncertainty. You know, folks, we live with uncertainty. It's just a part of our lives. And um, you know what? This is very connected to the Beatitudes with, and Jesus sitting on the Sermon of the Mount and he's speaking to these uncertain people. But it's, isn't it amazing how we crave certainty? We want to know that there will, this, what was, what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, you know, we've got elections this year. There's war all over the world, financial uncertainty. You know, are we going to be able to move? Can we move? You know, will he marry me? Won't he marry me? What's happening with the stock market? Will my investments be, uh, come true? What's going to happen with my health? What's going to happen with the test results? We, we, we're a people... We live with uncertainty. And the, here's the interesting thing. is, We believe that if we just knew how things would be, life would be better. But it turns out that is absolutely not the case. Let me show you this, um, th- this writing by, by Maggie Jackson. She writes a book called Uncertain. And she, this is what she writes. A wave of scientific discoveries, not just one, a wave of scientific discoveries reveals that leaning, uh, learning to lean into uncertainty in times of rapid change is a promising antidote, antidote to mental distress. If you can lean in to uncertainty, it's an amazing antidote to uncertainty. Instead of saying, I've got to know, I've got to know, I've got to know. She said it's not a royal road to August, as many of us assume. Now, folks, that's old English, and basically the royal road to August is where all your demons were taken away. Everything was fine. Life was just a, Arisa, it was just a rosy patch. You know, everything would go well. She said, no, it's not going to be like that if you knew everything. And then, then she quotes um, Michael Dugard. She says, he, he says, life is inherently uncertain. And if you have difficulty dealing with that, if you have difficulty dealing with uncertainty, you will have difficulty dealing with life. Michael Dugard, professor of psychology, the University of Quebec. You know, psychologists are now talking about being intolerant to uncertainty. Uh, The idea of this, we've got to know. We've got to know. If I just knew... There would be food, there would be an income, there would be this, there would be a house. If we just knew all that stuff, there won't be illness, we'll be fine. And psychologists are just discovering that is just not the case. This leads to, you know, when you are intolerant to uncertainty, what's going to happen? It leads to all sorts of problems in our lives, including substance abuse, mental disorders, suicide, disengagement from relationships, and so on, they say. Here's an, here's an interesting study. You'll need to listen to this. In one study, subjects were told they have a 50% chance of getting an electric shock. And uh, these people experience far more worry, far more pain, far more anxiety than those who were told there's a 100% chance you're going to get an electric shock. It's interesting. It was just the uncertainty. Those who knew we're going to get a shock in this experiment, they come to terms with it. But those who 50-50, we don't know or don't know. These people were far more worried, far more anxious, far more nervous, far more developing all sorts of mental dis- disorders. You, you would think this is good news that, hey, we, it's only 50% rather than those who are going to get shocked. But it turned out it was not the case. It turned out it was the uncertainty that was causing all the grief. 
you know, Maggie Jackson continued to say, and I don't think I put it up for you, at heart, being unsure, demands a crucial admission. The world is unpredictably dynamic, and it's flawed, and so are we. That's where we are. The world we live in is desperately flawed, but you and I, we are flawed too. It's uncertain what's hap- happening. About a, about a hundred years ago, a man by the name of uh, Heisenberg, he's a physicist, he discovered the uncertainty principle. It's, if you look it up, it's called the uncertainty principle. He said, and this is at the quantum level. Folks, the quantum level is below the nano level. It's like t- tiny, 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 tiny there. He said there are pairs of particles where if you, are clearly, if you, clearly, if you can clearly measure the one pair, you cannot measure the other one. There's certain things that are just uncertain in this life. We live in a world that is uncertain. And clearly, we need to develop the capacity and even the, the, the ability to embrace uncertainty. James, the brother of Jesus, speaks about this in James chapter 4, verse 13 to verse 16. Read with me now. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city. We will spend a year there. We'll carry on business. We will make money. Why do you not even, why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow, James, James says. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, You ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. In other words, this brother of Jesus, who really only became a true follower of Jesus after Jesus had died on the cross and been resurrected, James got the aha moment. He got the wow moment. He got the, got this, he, he writes in this very short, the only book he really writes, his only letter he writes, he said, listen guys, life is uncertain. Don't think you can make all these plans for the future and everything's going to come out. Don't be arrogant. What you need to really say is, if the Lord wills, we're going to do this and do that. We, it speaks about humility. And really, humility is just another word to express how we tolerate uncertainty in this world. It's a recognition that we are just finite beings. James, of course, gets this idea from his brother and uh, on the Sermon on the Mount. And, uh, you know, Jesus was speaking about, uh, you're worried about what you're going to eat, what you're going to wear, you know, what, you, what you're going to drink. And, and Jesus is going to say, listen, every day has enough trouble. This Sunday, it got enough trouble for, its, for itself. Don't worry about what's going to happen Monday, Tuesday, and, and Wednesday. Why are you worrying about the future? So James's antidote uh, to all this is to have faith. His antidote to this is have faith. James is going to say, if you are worried about all these uncertain things, it's a demonstration of a lack of faith that God will take care of it all. He said, uh, in fact, James didn't say this, but he, he has an example of a little baby. Now, babies are incredible. They live in the most uncertain world of all. They can do zero for themselves. They're totally dependent on someone else to feed them, clothe them, burp them, wh- 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 whatever. And, and so the babies live with this ability, with this confidence in a certain world that is a deep, listen to this, a deep-seated attachment, the very knowledge that there is a mom and there is a dad, a being of God-like competence who cares and watches over them. They just, there's this attachment for those of you little children, you see it. There is someone who's going to take care of all that. And that's what James, that's what Jesus is saying. We need to depend on an almighty Father who's going to take care of, of this. And this is really the fundamental need in our, in our human conditions. The, really the ability to face uncertainty 
the ability to face uncertainty in a world that is out of our control because there is a certainty and that is our almighty father jesus is the master of life he's the master of this world and when we develop a deep-seated attachment to him everything else gets taken care of and this is what jesus said and uh, PJ read this for us earlier this, this morning. Matthew chapter 5, and going back to the, to the, um, uh, the, the Beatitudes and that we spoke about last week. If you weren't here last week, we, we've, people are recognizing Beatitudes, Jesus' greatest work. The greatest words of the greatest master. Uh, uh, and, and we looked at different people from Thomas Aquinas to Mahatma Gandhi. People that say, just looking at Jesus and say, this, this is just too unbelievable for words. Some people called it his Mona Lisa, some called it his fifth symphony, like, like Beethoven, the pinnacle of his work. And Jesus says, chapter 5 and verse 1, and now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, he sat down, interesting, hey, he sat to teach these thousands of people, and his disciples came to him, he opened his mouth and began to teach them. Folks, these crowds were filled with uncertainty. I mean, they, you know, they, they lived in an occupied land. You, you talk about what's happening in, in Israel and Gaza right now. Our early brothers and sisters lived in an occupied land. It was occupied by Rome. They were dictated to do what they could do. They didn't know, uh, they didn't have certainty about the future. And it's interesting in the scripture, it says, he opened his mouth. This doesn't assume that, that Jesus was a ventriloquist the other time. This really just shows that the, the, this expression to open your mouth means that what he's about to say has significant weight to, to it. It's viable. It's deeply true. Look at Psalm chapter 78, verses 1 and 2. My people, hear my teachings. Listen to the words of my mouth. And then he says, the psalmist says, I will open my mouth. Folks, you can't speak by not opening your mouth. But here, here's the thing is, opening my mouth means to say, the words I'm going to say are of weight. They, they are valuable. Listen to them. And folks, this is what's, uh, you, uh, by the way, this is a directly quote, a quote. It's a prophecy of Jesus. And you can see that in Matthew chapter, um, uh, chapter 13. But let's have a look at Matthew chapter 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You know, in Jesus' day, poor of spirit was not a, a desired condition. Because often you look at these people, it, it was linked to their, their, their poverty. It was linked to, to having nothing. It was linked to, to being dependent on others for your, your... If you don't, somebody gives you something to eat, you, don't, you can't reach in your back pocket and pull out your purse or your wallet these people were materially poor so many of them they had low status they weren't connected and no one was listening to them jesus said hang on blessed are the poor in spirit those who are humble so why would jesus call these people blessed and this is it is because the kingdom of heaven a different type of kingdom was coming to them this was jesus's simple message and his simple message that life is not uh, unavailable, that kingdom life is not unavailable to us humans. It is available. And it doesn't matter whether you are the haves or the not haves. Kingdom uh, treasures, kingdom blessings are available to us here. And he has another interesting thing um, that Jesus does. He, he bookends the Beatitudes with the, the, the kingdom of heaven is yours. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So he'll start, theirs is the kingdom of heaven, and then he gives all the other beatitudes, and then once again he says, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Folks, you need to know this is present tense. This is not suffer here, and one day God will bless you. It's not like that. It's the, this is the thing. You, you're going to understand that you can have kingdom of heaven blessings right now. All the other bad beatitudes, by the way, I don't know if you ever noticed this, all the other beatitudes, the promises are in the future. For instance, let me give you an example. 
Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. They will be comforted. But these other two, the bookends, the first and the last, yours is the kingdom of heaven. It can be ours. No, yours is the, the kingdom of heaven. It can be theirs. The kingdom, is, the kingdom is really Jesus' language to describe life in the care, life, life in the presence, life in the power of God. We can have that, and we can have it now. You, you know, we all like our kingdoms to be where we're in charge, where we can dictate, we can control the variables, we can control the unavoidables, and, and that's our kingdoms. But you know, that, that kingdom is very uncertain. And so Jesus is, is saying, I tell you, why don't you come to me, all your weary, heavy laden. I'll give you rest. And the way you get that, take your kingdom, give it to me. Because there can be uncertainty in all that uncertainty. The kingdom of heaven is God in action. The kingdom of heaven is God in action in our lives, in an uncertain world. So this is what gives us certainty in an uncertain world. And that's it. God is trustworthy. God is trustworthy. There, there is a spiritual reality attached to the great God. He made everything. He promises to take care of us. And maybe a little, as little children, we need to just develop this this crazy attachment to our heavenly Father who is able to take care of all the uh, uncertainty in our world. Folks, here's the kicker. Here's the kicker. Today, just, just one message. Don't look for certainty. Look for God. If you leave here with nothing else, maybe just leave here with this. Today, don't look for certainty in this world. You're not going to find it. Just look for God. Look for God. Don't look for certainty in the stock market, in your financial position, or in your health, in other people's relationships with you. Th that's just not going to happen. F things will go up and things will go down. And that's just uh, a laugh. We need to, we need to, in fact, I, I, I found this book called Practicing the Presence of God. And it was written. Uh, around about the 7th century, uh, 17th century by a man by the name of Brother Lawrence. And I really like the title. I've never read it. Practicing the Presence of, of God. Sometimes or, or somebody spoke about that we live in crazy town. Is it, is it just me or just like, are you agree that everybody just got mad? The world has just gone absolutely crazy. And just when some craziness, you kind of begin to get used to that type of craziness. Some other crazy comes out. Roland was reminding me last week that there is a woman who was suing her parents because she was born. She said they should have, they should have visited a seance, a caravan person with a bulb globe or something in a tent somewhere just up to see if she wanted to be born or not has the world got absolutely bonkers has the world gone bonkers we live we face in a uns an uncertain life and the number one thing you and I must do is this seek Ye first, the kingdom of God. That's it all about. Develop that attachment to the kingdom of God. And, uh, you know, that invitation is for you here today. It's an invitation to all of us. God said, you live in this crazy world? I don't make it crazy. In the beginning, God created this and this and this. And God said it was good. And along came man, messed it all up. God had a plan. He sent to us Jesus. And he's saying to us, you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and everything will be added to you again. So, uh, folks, when you don't know what's going to happen next, when you don't know what the diagnosis is going to be next, or whether there will be another paycheck, this is what you need to remember. Seek 
first the kingdom of God. Don't look for certainty in an uncertainty. Look for God. And so I close with that, that beatitude, that one that we love so much. And I've changed the words. Blessed are the uncertain, for the kingdom of God is coming to you today. Blessed are you if you're uncertain. Don't worry. The kingdom of God is available to you today. Let's uh, have a word of prayer, and then we will sing. Holy Father in heaven, we come to you today acknowledging, Father, our world is messed up. Father, we are messed up. Thank you for the certainty of our salvation in Jesus. Father, thank you that, that we can have an attachment to our Savior. Father, that in, in which we don't have to worry about tomorrow. The eat, the drink, the wear, the why, the what, the how. That we have got, Father, you taking care of us, having given us, given us a son, Father, to take care of our biggest problem, and that is the sin in our lives. We're extremely grateful, Father. Hallowed be your name. Amen.